So hi everyone. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, you had a nice first half of the week and uh, um, we are really grateful that you decided to spend some time together with International Law Committee uh, of Ukrainian Bar Association today and uh, our topic on international sanctions, what's new for, for Ukraine. Uh, actually, the topic of sanctions is quite important for Ukraine, for international community, for Ukrainian Bar Association. That is why I just noticed that once a year we organized, um, we are organizing um, events concerning Ukraine and sanctions. A um, couple of years ago it was Iranian sanctions and uh, trade with Iran, uh, with agriculture commodities. Uh, last year we spoke about a um, uh, topic um, concerned with the armed conflict. Uh, two years ago we spoke about uh, Crimean annexation and the topic of sanctions in uh, this um, uh, contents, context, but today uh, we are going to talk about one more um, part of uh, this topic. Uh, we will uh, speak about the use of international sanctions um, against um, uh, different uh, persons, uh, against different companies. We will touch um, upon a topic on um, sanctions against own citizens in different countries who will speak about uh, real or fake risks of uh, international disputes involving Ukraine due to this. And uh, I am really happy to um, uh, have uh, such uh, professional and interesting speakers today. Uh, today we have uh, Jake Closer. Uh, Jake is a lawyer from Australia and he's co-founder of Foreign Lawyers Network uh, here in Sweden. He works at uh, one of uh, the biggest Swedish law firms and uh, he will speak about the use of international sanctions, the Australian and the Swedish perspectives. Uh, actually, Jake uh, has, um, together with Jake, we have pu published uh, an article concerning this topic. Uh, so Jake will um, impress us today with uh, his super interesting presentation as he always do. Uh, and um, uh, if you want to have more details, you are more than welcome to check that article. And also we have uh, Bogdan Bernatsky, he is senior lecturer of the National University of Kiev Mohila Academy. Uh, he will speak about real or fake risks as a result of imposing sanctions against own, citizen, um, own citizens in Ukraine in the European Court, Court of Human Rights. He will speak also about um, recent um, legislative changes or proposals um, in terms of this topic. And uh, we also have myself, Olga Kuchmienko. I am deputy head of the International Law Committee of Ukrainian Bar Association and uh, I'm PhD attorney at law and today I will share my opinion on uh, sanctions against own citizens. Is it possible and is there any rationale behind it? So uh, I propose to start uh, just a couple of organizational issues. Uh, this um, event is um, broadcasted on Facebook, on page of International Law Committee, so please free to share that um, stream so everyone can join us here or there. If you have any questions, please uh, do not hesitate to post them in the chat and we will um, have a roundtable discussion in the end um, of this event. Uh, then I think that we may start we may start with uh, Jake's topic, the use of international sanctions, the Australian and Swedish perspectives. So Jake, the floor is yours. Thank you. And let's start. Thank you so much, Olga. Uh, just the traditional question to start almost any presentation. Can you hear me and see me? Thank you. Uh, so now the next step uh, is the actual sharing of the PowerPoint. Uh, let me full screen. Thank you. I saw I saw some thumbs up. So that is a good start. Um, yes. So thank you so much, uh, Olga, and to the Ukrainian Bar Association for uh, this invitation to speak today. 
uh, on this, what I think is a really interesting and, and very relevant topic. Uh, I appreciate that uh, when, when my name is first mentioned amongst such excellent speakers uh, from, from Ukraine, there may be questions, what, what does an Australian qualified lawyer currently based in Stockholm, Sweden, what, what might that, they have to say that is of any relevance to, to Ukraine? And there are definitely some points uh, that I think that are useful and and that have crossover. So I hope with my presentation that the, the relevance of my participation uh, will be clearer. And uh, I'm, I'm, as I say, very, very excited to to be here speaking on this topic. Um, so and thank you also, Olga, for those kind words. I hope that it is as interesting as as. Uh, I clearly have been before. So I, I'm sure that uh, for such esteemed speakers and uh, people uh, participating in, and uh, in the audience, it will be no surprise um, that the lawyer begins with some definitions to think first, well, what, what are sanctions when we, when we talk about them? And uh, I consider the definition here that sanctions refer to measures which do not involve the use of armed force and that are imposed in situations of so-called international concern. Uh, then if we go further, well, okay, and then what is what is the purpose of, of sanctions really then? And uh, again, I consider that the best understanding is that sanctions are used to end situations of international concern by influencing those responsible. And sanctions can also be used to limit the adverse effects of situations of international concern, as well as to penalize those responsible for such a situation. So when we refer to sanctions, in general, they are not targeted at, at your average person on the street, but rather to those higher up who are more likely to be able to uh, influence proceedings and, and the source of the situations of international concern. So in particular, uh, politicians and business people are frequently targeted by sanctions because they have the capacity to influence those responsible in a way that uh, the average citizen, of course, is not able to. So if we continue on, um, why is it or does it continue to be a topic of interest? Well, uh, what's interesting is that sanctions have been on the rise since the Arab Spring, so since approximately 2011. So uh, again, this was a particular choice, I suspect, in the wake of a, a range of incidents, for example, the war in Iraq and various other uh, military conflicts, which of course uh, were very controversial and uh, the, the benefits of them, of course, uh, continue to be questioned today. And when you compare the use of military force versus non-military force measures uh, that are not involving the military, it makes sense that perhaps that uh, nation states are looking to, to use more measures that perhaps will influence and in a way that doesn't cause uh, any, any um, or have any military um, uh, aspect to it. Um, and as of this year, there's a total of 14 UN sanctions regimes in place. Uh, so the UN sanctions regimes, of course, for those of you who are uh, interested in international law, uh, those are binding uh, on all nations and uh, and apply automatically, of course, uh, once implemented by uh, the UN Security Council, among others. And the key other regimes, in addition to the UN, are, of course, the US, one of the most prolific actors within the sanctions uh, regime, uh, setting of regimes, and uh, then, of course, the EU. What I've referred to here as CANZUC, which is a, an amalgamation of Canada, 
Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom being, of course, uh, uh, has traditionally acted as a key player uh, within international uh, politics and relations, and of course continues to be a permanent member of the UN uh, Security Council uh, with the powers of veto, among other things that that entails. Um, but those nations have a shared uh, historical background and uh, generally very aligned on their foreign policy ambitions. And as a result, I have lumped them together there a little bit. Um, but of course, in my presentation, I will be looking uh, particularly at one of those uh, members um, being Australia. And of course, the more recent um, players on within the sanctions world uh, is, is absolutely China. The, the use of uh, sanctions by the, the People's Republic of China uh, has increased uh, also in tandem with the imposition of more sanctions uh, against uh, it and its citizens. Um, but it is interesting uh, to, to consider that in the future, China will be one of uh, the key actors and possibly with, uh, if, the, if things continue on a similar trajectory, it may be that China and the US uh, are considered equal players within uh, international sanctions. And of course, uh, Russia and uh, its sanctions regime continues to be uh, one of the key uh, regimes uh, in international relations. So Olga touched on this a little bit and I'm sure it will be uh, focused on uh, in, in greater depth why sanctions, international sanctions, are of relevance to legal practitioners, to, to those in, in business. Well, um, it, it, I, I forgot to mention in the introduction of myself that I, I work um, predominantly in M&A and international arbitration here in Sweden. And of course, when we're dealing with such transactions between international companies, international entities, there's the movement of currencies between uh, across borders and of course, uh, a range of uh, covenants and uh, other um, conditions of, of transactions that may well rely on, on payments in certain currencies or even the payment, uh, the receipt of payment by certain time points. And all of these can lead to private uh, disputes between uh, entirely innocent third parties who are simply caught up in a regime that perhaps a little more due diligence perhaps may have alerted them to such risks, but in general, it, it can affect people almost by surprise that uh, a, a counterparty is suddenly unable to make a payment in a particular currency simply because of um, uh, an, an, a, a sanctions regime in force. Um, the most common uh, such regime uh, being the US, where its uh, economic might can really uh, cause impact on, uh, uh, really affect parties uh, potentially in unexpected ways. Um, but I think that will come in, in uh, one of the further presentations, so I won't dwell on that. Now getting to a topic um, that of course gets me very excited. Uh, you might see and recognize Uluru, the heart of Australia there on the presentation. So what is Australia? Well, it's considered to be a middle power in the sense that it's not one of the, uh, of course, one of the bigger actors, the G7, it isn't so big, um, but in its uh, it is one of the, the top 20 in size economies in the world and its connections both to the US and the UK as well as its position in Asia have given it a considerable ability um, to, uh, I suppose you, you could describe it as, uh, to, to fulfill some of its uh, foreign policy aims. It has a, a platform perhaps somewhat larger and louder than than others, uh, or, or more, more audible, I should say, than, than others. Um, and indeed, one of its key aims is to influence um, the international decision makers. So for Australia, 
it's very important to have uh, a voice at the table and particularly to have the ears of, for example, its, its closest ally, uh, it, certainly militarily, uh, the US, but also that it has the ability to, to engage in discussions with um, China, which is its uh, largest trading partner, its largest economic partner by quite some distance, which it makes for a very difficult balancing act for Australia to play. Uh, and it, it wants to make sure that its voice can in some way be heard amidst a, a range of global economic security and environmental challenges. I mentioned the Iraq war uh, earlier. Australia went in uh, at the request of the US as a supporting um, uh, military uh, with, with support, military support. And this uh, was certainly controversial at the time and, and continues to be now, but I think it's indicative of the way that Australia sees its, uh, its, its key foreign policy aims. Uh, and that leads me to the current China-US paradox that I alluded to in that Australia is our, uh, China is Australia's key um, uh, trading partner but the US is its, its key military partner. And uh, when we consider the geopolitics, uh, Australia has, has found itself in a very difficult balancing act at times. And with the current uh, COVID-19 situation where Australia's borders are effectively closed and uh, Australia was leading among the efforts to have an investigation into the source of the virus, um, there are, it, it seems that Australia is, is trying to assert itself in a way and also to, in a way, perhaps not simply uh, kowtow to the expectations of its biggest trading partner in China. So a very short introduction into what Australia is. Um, so the, the, the sanctions regime in Australia is um, as I mentioned, it's, it's uh, of course, as a member of the UN and, and bound by uh, the sanctions imposed by the UN, uh, it, it is, um, all, all multilateral sanctions are a part of the Australian sanctions regime. So, uh, and the key sources you can see on the screen there, uh, essentially the, the decisions of the Security Council, and these are uh, automatically, have automatic legal effect through um, the legislation, the Charter of the United Nations Act 1945. Uh, and then what makes Australia somewhat interesting is that it also imposes its, its own unilateral sanctions. And uh, I've, I've done a little screen grab there from, from Wikipedia. And I think it, it indicates where, um, well, geographically, just how far away Australia is from where we are uh, this evening. And uh, also, I suppose, on which side of the fence it, it sits. And you can see here, um, th th this is a, an image in relation to the sanctions regimes uh, uh, that were imposed uh, in the wake of, of uh, the Ukrainian crisis. Um, uh, and of course, uh, most of the sanctions, I believe, are, are still ongoing. Um, so why, why um, I suppose, uh, the next question, um, you know, Australia can impose autonomously its sanctions based on uh, the legislation there on, on the screen, the Autonomous Sanctions Act. Uh, of 2011 and uh, the uh, enabling the, the regulations thereunder of the same year. And the regime is uh, administered uh, or, or the sanctions are under the auspices of the Australian Sanctions Office, which is a part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is the, the, the Foreign Affairs Ministry of the uh, Federal Government of Australia. So. Um, for background, Australia is, is a federal nation, much like uh, the US, where there's a central federal government and then the states have their own uh, legislatures as well. But it's the federal government with responsibility for all foreign affairs and, and relations. Uh, so this is why it's a, it's a centralized um, system that is imposed. Uh, now, next. Oh, yes. Well, 
you know, it, yes, we we've, we can or Australia can impose sanctions, but what are the kinds of measures that they might do? Um, well, uh, as you can see on the screen, the, the, the main ones imposed relate to the restrictions on the trade of goods and services um, to and from Australia. Uh, the restrictions on the conduct of commercial activities. So that could relate to um, uh, securities, uh, you know, shares and so on. Um, targeted financial sanctions being against uh, individual persons or, or companies uh, and travel bans. Although, as I mentioned, with the current COVID situation, there aren't, uh, there, there isn't a lot of international travel taking place. Um, but the, the, the power to impose a ban in theory e exists, even if in practice it's not really taking place. So um, now we can sort of answer a little bit, well, why was Australia um, keen to be uh, or, or keen to support the imposition of, of sanctions uh, in relation to um, the Ukrainian crisis? Well. I, I think the some of the key events for Australia were uh, date back to uh, 2014 and the annexation of, of Crimea, of the peninsula, um, which Australia absolutely considers to be an illegal act. And uh, then the, the subsequent or, or in part in relation to the geopolitical situation in the region, um, you may remember that there was a, uh, a flight, a passenger flight from the Netherlands uh, to Malaysia, um, flight MH17, which was down um, in above Ukrainian uh, airspace. And uh, there were, I think, 38 Australian citizens or residents on board that particular flight. And uh, of course, everyone on board lost, tragically lost their lives. And so I think uh, certainly some of these events um, drew a great deal of attention um, from both Australian politicians and the media and then a uh, foreign minister um, was, uh, it, it probably didn't make much news uh, outside of Australia but uh, she was very keen for it to be seen that she was speaking very firmly to, to the Russian president at certain uh, international meetings between uh, heads of state and, and foreign ministers and so on and uh, and to really be using very tough rhetoric about uh, uh, Russia and uh, President Putin. So um, I, I think that is part of the explanation um, and in addition of course to Australia's broader support of uh, uh, the US and its foreign policy aims, and also to a lesser extent, uh, the UK and the European Union. And the UK, of course, at the time was still a member state of the EU. So I think it, both its um, traditional partners, as well as its own personal as, or its own interests, the interests of its own citizens were awakened by these uh, particular incidents. And as a result, um, you can see on the screen there um, a rough uh, a breakdown of the Australian sanctions regimes in place. Um, in the purple there, it's the UN Security Council sanctions regimes, which, uh, as I mentioned, are automatically applicable. Um, and then on the blue, in the blue bubble, it's the Australian uh, autonomous sanctions regimes. And uh, you'll note there that um, one of the um, bullet points is Russia slash Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I think here there's a great risk for confusion um, because, of course, th there aren't particular uh, sanctions against uh, Ukraine or, uh, as far as I understand, against U Ukrainian citizens, um, but for the fact that they are in relation to um, the Crimea and also uh, to some of the separatist regions uh, in the east. And as a result, the decision was clearly taken here by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to to place these two uh, side by side, perhaps in part to suggest, well, uh, if we acknowledge the fact that uh, Ukraine as a whole includes all its territory, um, even if 
it may have de facto control or they may be de facto controlled by another power how do we express that and also in a very succinct um uh, set of <laughs> bubbles on on the screen um in a part of what's it called uh, uh, it's not a pie diagram i should remember this but the, the venn diagram a venn diagram thank you primary school uh so I thought it was important to to display this screenshot, and and I think also important um, to raise this simply because it demonstrates how there is confusion, or, or how easily um, businesses and those acting on behalf of clients, perhaps looking at this, might uh, might perhaps not check further and simply assume that sanctions regimes apply to both uh, equally or uh, to individuals from, from both um, sides and, and, and not fully understand the nuances involved here, um, which of course can hardly be summarized in, in this kind of an image. So I think uh, important to, re to raise there. And uh, I think it, it is something that, um, uh, that lawyers in particular are becoming more and more aware of. Um, how am I doing for time, Olga? You might need to tell me to hurry up if, if, I'm, if I'm going too slowly. Um, but I just thought just quickly here, um, the penalties for non-compliance or, or violations of, of sanctions can be very hefty in, in Australia and uh, even up to 10 years in prison uh, for individuals um, and various uh, uh, penalty fines uh, that can be imposed. Um, the penalty unit system in Australia, um, it, as in other countries, is used so that it can be automatically adjusted for inflation without having to change uh, a whole range of, of legislation, subsidiary legislation. But uh, if we look there, the rough value at the moment of uh, a penalty unit is about 140 euros. Um, so, you know, we're looking at over a million uh, euros uh, as, as, a, as a penalty, maximum penalty for companies. Um, but it's also worth noting that in Australia that, um, that there is attribution, it's possible to attribute uh, corporate uh, criminal behaviour to individual company officers. Um, but it's also worth stating that uh, in relation to penalties, there is an extra, or in relation to sanctions, there is an extraterritorial focus uh, that is imposed. Uh, that is to say that the regime applies to those outside of Australia. Um, and I think I understand that one of the questions that will be discussed is, is the imposition of sanctions against one's own citizens. And in the case of Australia, although it's never come up, the wording of the legislation certainly would suggest that uh, if there is an Australian citizen abroad, that um, so long as they're not on Australian territory, there may be a possibility for uh, individual sanctions to be imposed on, on such an individual. But as I say, this has not been tested uh, in the courts in Australia. Um, Moving to Sweden, where I am now, and uh, and that's actually not a bad reflection of of the weather and and how the the Swedish Parliament building looks at the moment. Um, of course, many of you will be aware that Sweden is historically a neutral country, and of course has its history with uh, Ukraine as well. I understand that there's a small town somewhere in Ukraine that that has uh, a connection to Sweden. Um, and, and of course, the colours of the flag, I'm sure then that's more than just a, a coincidence, perhaps. Um, but its historical neutrality was, was expressed by uh, former Prime Minister Olof Palme, where Sweden's approach is alliance in peace and neutrality in war. Um, but such neutrality is not to mean silence, and certainly it's, it's often quite vocal. Uh, in, in its uh, opinions and its statements directed overseas. Um, one of the things that is, is certainly very current in Sweden is the so-called NATO debate. Uh, Sweden has a, a, a historical 
uh, fear of Russia, um, which is of course dating back to to the wars of, of several hundred years ago now, um, but thereafter Sweden has has essentially been neutral and uh, and of course the fear during the Cold War and and at times reawakening is that there there continues to be um, this this power right on its doorstep that. Uh, uh, it must be ready to at least meet in some capacity. And this is why uh, it, it's an ongoing discussion whether Sweden should join NATO. Uh, and of course, when Sweden joined the EU, it did lose some of its uh, official neutrality simply because uh, much of the um, its ability to have an independent foreign policy has been curtailed by EU membership. But we'll uh, get to that in a second. Um, it's also worth noting that Sweden considers itself to be a humanitarian superpower, uh, and I think you can see a, a good example of this in its uh, acceptance of refugees following uh, the outbreak of, of uh, and, and um, increased number of refugees arriving from the Middle East, and in particular Syria in 2015, uh, when Sweden, I think it was in 2016, Sweden took in more refugees or asylum seekers um, is probably the more accurate name, uh, more per capita than any other EU state. And uh, I think only Germany had more uh, as, a, as a total. Uh, so, so it does certainly uh, meet some of its uh, own expectations. Um, and Sweden is a, is a strong promoter of free trade, um, but it is worth noting that for all of its uh, humanitarian uh, ambitions, perhaps, it is also one of the world's top arms exporters, certainly per capita, and one of the top 20 in the world. So uh, perhaps there's, there's something of a, uh, a contradiction there, perhaps, in, in, in some of the ways Sweden does act, but uh, certainly um, a, a good basis for, for the Swedish position. Um, as I mentioned, it's an EU member state, and uh, in contrast to Australia, that means that all of its uh, sanctions are essentially um, imposed multilaterally, so through the European Union's uh, common foreign and security policy uh, and its uh, internal regulations. There is some capacity for, the, uh, for Sweden to impose sanctions uh, unilaterally. And this typically relates uh, to, uh, as you can see there, um, the residents in Sweden of foreign nationals, again, a sort of trade and export, um, and, and in relation to various other activities, as you can see, manufacture, communications, education. Um, but it, its uh, ability to impose sanctions is, is, is very limited. And essentially, it only does so through, in, it, through its multilateral um, uh, connections. Uh, and yes, oh, you can see there, I've repeated myself, um, but that is the, the source there, the, the Act on Certain International Sanctions from 1996, which is roughly when uh, uh, Sweden joins uh, the European Union. Uh, it joined in, in 1995. Um, it is also worth noting that in Sweden, uh, if, there are, if there were to be sanctions that target Swedish citizens in Sweden, such sanctions will not be enforced if they would infringe the economic and social security responsibility of the Swedish state. So essentially, the, the state must still ensure that its citizens have access to sufficient means to, to live uh, in line with uh, the, the basic requirements uh, expected for uh, those living in Sweden. So um, this has actually been tested uh, in court, and this is the uh, the legal um, uh, results that that um, is is uh, now the case that that um, you cannot simply impose or, or the Swedish state cannot simply impose uh, sanctions uh, to the point that they would infringe a person's economic and social security. Um, in in Sweden, the penalties are somewhat less strict compared to Australia. Um, and uh, only up to four years prison for serious offences, 
and uh, and um, the case that any profits derived from breaches uh, may be forfeited. So it, it's more of a discretionary basis, although I imagine uh, most most of the time any profits from from the breach of sanctions would probably be seized. Um, I think uh, in terms of the recent developments, um, it's, it's worth noting that, that Sweden has um, taken a leading role and been very active in uh, reforming um, and, and refining the global sanctions regime, and in particular with a focus on increasing due process protections. Uh, and it has even uh, co-developed uh, certain uh, bodies such as uh, the ombudsperson in relation to certain sanctions regimes. Uh, ombud being a, a Swedish word and uh, referring to uh, a person essentially appointed to, to represent uh, and, and to be a source of protection for, for persons, a person that you can turn to in, in if you require it. Um, uh, and uh, so a, a very Swedish um, entity there. Um, I think it's also worth um, pointing out that when uh, when the recent or 2011, so 10 years ago now, but uh, when the EU at that point in time were considering imposing sanctions against various businesses um, working in Syria and that had um, that they considered might be working to um, support the regime, um, the EU being opposed to the Assad regime in Syria, um, that Sweden actually reportedly blocked some proposed uh, EU sanctions against firms that, that had a commercial connection to, to Ericsson, which of course is one of the uh, larger telecommunications firms and uh, one of the biggest firms in Sweden. Um, although this was denied at the time, um, but the fact that uh, such discussions leaked um, do, does suggest that there may be something in it, in this kind of a rumour, um, otherwise it wouldn't have, have leaked to the press, I suspect. Um, but as mentioned, well, for Sweden, if it is to, to uh, I impose sanctions, it must do so uh, alongside its EU member states uh, generally, and, and therefore there's a significant amount of lobbying that has to go on. And this is somewhat difficult because frequently there must be unanimity in EU decisions amongst the member states. And we can see even recently um, with the situation in Israel-Palestine where the uh, EU, I think it was 26 of the 27 member states uh, proposed uh, or, or agreed to um, issue a statement calling for um, a ceasefire, I believe, and, and perhaps certain other um, restrictions or, or uh, it was certainly targeted at, at, at the Israel side, and this was vetoed by one of the EU member states. So it just indicates how there is quite a, a balancing act that, that Sweden has to, has to play and that it is beholden to, to its fellow member states when it comes to international relations in, in a significant, uh, to a significant extent. Um, so I think from my conclusion or from, from my presentation, I think it's uh, easy to conclude that um, clearly Australia has, has a much more independent uh, foreign policy uh, and therefore uh, ability to impose uh, sanctions uh, compared to Sweden and of course many other countries, but that frequently uh, there is uh, alignment between the ultimate objectives of, of Sweden and Australia. So um, this is why I have um, the, the fluffy koalas uh, there uh, with, with their you know, mother and cub and, and then possibly a, a nice Swedish uh, family of elk there. Um, I would certainly not advise that you um, hug a koala though, unless you have someone there to make sure it's safe to do so because they're actually, they can actually be quite aggressive and violent. So uh, as cuddly as they look, look but don't touch would be my advice. And I suspect the same probably applies to the Swedish elk as well. Um, but that was uh, my presentation. Uh, so once again, thank you so much uh, to Olga and to the Ukrainian Bar Association. And uh, I look forward to hearing the other presentations.
Thank you, Jake. Thank you for um, such detailed and interesting and clear presentation. I am sure that our audience will have questions to you, but uh, I um, propose uh, to act like that we may post questions in the chat or we may uh, have a um, round table discussion in the end when uh, all speakers uh, has chance to speak. Uh, both of these options, of course, um, uh, can be um, used by us today. So uh, thank you, Jake. Uh, we have uh, heard about Australian and uh, Swedish um, approach to sanctions and um, we talked a bit about uh, policies. And uh, I propose uh, now to move to the second uh, subtopic, sanctions against own citizens. Um, mainly in Ukraine, is it possible? And um, is there any rationale behind that? Um, I think that I might share just a um, very basic presentation just for us to make it more comfortable. But there is no that much text and it is not such um, uh, nice as Jake's one. Uh, so uh, today um, I wanted to, to invite us to speak about sanctions against our uh, own citizens uh, since uh, this topic um, was quite hot for uh, Ukraine for a couple of um, I think months or even more. Um, just uh, to Remind in February uh, this year, so three uh, months ago, there were uh, sanctions against uh, two um, Ukrainian uh, personalities, I would say, uh, Viktor Medvedchuk and um, his uh, business partner uh, Kozak, and there were s seven more people. It was Me Viktor Medvedchuk's wife and um, uh, six more people. And then it was um, a uh, couple of uh, it was Ukrainian channel. It was couple of um, uh, companies that were associated with uh, these people. It was super hot topic whether Ukraine could impose these sanctions, whether Ukraine should have imposed these sanctions, whether president had such a power, whether um, actually there is a legal opportunity to impose such sanctions against it, um, its own citizens, and uh, in May just. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was um, a new splash of this topic that uh, criminal proceedings against uh, Viktor Medvedchuk uh, were started. So uh, this uh, topic did not stop just on sanctions. And, um, uh, you know, uh, when in February there was all this news. Uh, Jake and I commented um, a couple of times uh, this topic in different um, contexts uh, to uh, Ukrainian uh, media. And uh, there were two expert articles um, uh, written. And then uh, just in one day, I think, uh, I think Ukrainian Bar Association may uh, confirm there were about like 10 or more uh, reports of uh, this um, um, expert opinion, I would say, in uh, different uh, media, in different uh, news, even some foreign, um, okay, Russian um, newspapers um, wrote something about that. So it was really important and it is really interesting um, a topic uh, to speak about. And uh, my um, aim today is to speak about international sanctions against its own citizens in Ukraine in two elements. Is it possible and is it needed? And uh, mainly I would say that um, my aim today is to offer one more approach to look at this topic and uh, invite Bhutan in more details to uh, share his expert opinion and participants to discuss it. Uh, Jake just started uh, from the um, what sanctions is and uh, he said that um, it is measures aimed to bring the situation of international concern to an end by influences 
influencing those responsible. I mean, the main uh, word here is influencing. So um, mm, when we speak about sanction, we want to influence person just to stop doing something and to impose uh, liability uh, on this person. Uh, so if this aim, if we remember about this aim, we may uh, move on. So uh, international sanctions are imposed uh, if uh, there are no other measures to stop the breach or a crime of foreign citizen in Ukraine. So speaking about this, we are remembering why do we speak about sanctions? Because there might be situation that you want to stop or influence or um, impose liability on the person and uh, there are no other measures to do it. Uh, the second situation, it might be that uh, if the fact of the crime is confirmed by competent foreign authority and the international community, and every state wants to support the state and impose liability on this person um, according to its national law. Um, thirdly, it, uh, we may speak about sanctions if there are grounds to impose sanctions according to international and national law. That means that uh, we cannot uh, impose sanctions uh, just as substitute of uh, any liability and when just it is easier or we just want to do it. So what, uh, when we are speaking about international sanctions against its own citizens, um, is it um, ge generally possible? It is. Uh, in general, it is possible. Um, there are um, countries uh, that um, uh, have done it. I think that um, Jake, um, touched upon a bit this topic and uh, in more details he deliberated, we deliberated in um, the article and um, uh, we can see that usually this option is not excluded uh, under national law of foreign states or even Ukraine. So according to article uh, 1.2 of the law of Ukraine on sanctions, um, uh, you actually may uh, impose sanctions on uh, people that provide the acts of terrorism. Um, the law is silent on the citizenship of uh, these um, um, persons and uh, I just uh, have a part, one slide in Ukrainian, it's just part of the law. Um, and uh, you may see that um, people um, you may see that uh, the law prescribes uh, to sanctions against uh, different people of foreign state, foreign um, uh, company, foreign um, citizen, but uh, when we speak about uh, ter act of terrorism, it is silent on citizenship. Uh, but um, so we may say that in principle it is possible if we think theoretically about this. But uh, is it needed? Uh, if we uh, look at this topic uh, from perspective, um, is it possible and then uh, is it needed? Uh, we may find uh, and draw different uh, interesting conclusions. First of all, um, if we speak about sanctions and for example, the person uh, is Ukrainian citizen, because now we are talking about Ukrainian citizens only, and um, he is, is situated in the territory of Ukraine, why do we need uh, sanctions and not ordinary measures of liability? It might be civil, criminal, administrative, etc. Um, it was the main actually concern of um, experts and um, media when we started to speak about sanctions and uh, when um, the uh, when sanctions were imposed, um, some commentators said, um, ah, why do you need it? You could have um, imposed uh, some liability. And other um, commentators uh, tried to say, oh, yeah, it's good. We may uh, just do additional influence. And where is the truth? So um, if sanctions, uh, I think that uh, we may try to approach uh, this question um, 
with uh, two um, different um, options. So first of all, uh, if sanctions bring added value to the process of uh, stopping the breach, um, that might be okay to impose sanctions. And if not, uh, then uh, we may say that uh, it, this sanction may uh, breach uh, the principle of rule of law. What do I mean? Uh, if you, uh, we open uh, Article 4 of the Law of Ukraine on sanctions, there are 25 items in Article 25 on which measures um, might be imposed is a person, um, if a person uh, has become a designated person according to Ukrainian law. Um, and uh, when we analyze all that list, uh, we may say that there are some measures that, that are close to impossible to be taken if sanctions are not imposed. I mean that uh, there are super limited grounds to impose uh, that hmm, restrictions uh, on the person if it is not under Ukrainian sanctions. So for example, some complex situation, restriction of foreign vessel or to enter territorial waters of Ukraine. Or uh, there are other group of um, examples if some measures might be resulted from commercial or criminal proceedings. Like, for example, in Jake's um, example, it was about blocking of the bank account. You may block a person's account if there is a criminal um, proceedings uh, under certain circumstances, or it might be as um, separate measure in commercial or civil proceedings. So uh, why do we need sanctions uh, in uh, case number two? I mean, this one, when uh, we may speak about um, other types of uh, liability. Do they have broader influence or um, are they easier to prove or not to prove and just to impose without any legal grounds? Or is it just a political measure to show that something is happening, but um, not imposing any real liability on the person? Um, in these questions are open, and uh, they are here just to invite uh, Bogdan in his presentation um, and in our discussion to speak about that. But in any event, uh, I would say that procedure uh, must be followed. So if there is um, uh, no procedure or if procedure is uh, not clear, it is bad. Because um, other, if in such a case uh, procedure was uh, not followed or it was not clear and there were some mistakes, uh, there is a risk that the uh, state of Ukraine might be responsible for any violation of human rights. Um, if we speak about um, sanctions against um, own citizen. So for example, um, is it possible to bring a case to European um, Court of Human Rights for violation of property rights? Um, it's an open question that uh, was um, actually the main uh, name of almost all reports of our article. So uh, I think that um, it is um, good that we are here just to discuss uh, these approaches and uh, just before we will invite uh, uh, Bohdan to speak about uh, these questions and to present his um, uh, information about um, recent legislation, uh, recent um, um, legis legislative proposals. Uh, I would say that uh, in any event, international sanctions against uh, its own citizen might take place, but uh, any mechanism real, uh, I mean, already existing or proposed that will be mm, enforced must be followed. Even if so, it shall be an exceptional measure and not a substitute to the available types of liability. So what I'm saying, if you have a variety of measures to impose on person just to stop or influence this person in legal, proper, institutional manner, maybe you shall think twice before imposing sanctions as um, only measure. But um, if um, there is any added value, uh, maybe it uh, might be reasonable. And any potential changes shall be assessed from the necess necess necessity standpoint and answer the questions. Is there any additional 
additional effect from this measure. It is this approach that we talked about right now. So rule of law following legal procedure and uh, remembering the principle that the person cannot be responsible twice for the same breach uh, shall prevail in this case. So uh, here I would stop because um, I am talking too much today and uh, I would like to um, invite Bogdan to maybe comment on these uh, questions that were raised and um, comment in terms of uh, recent um, proposals, in terms of current legislation, you know, in terms of uh, his expert opinion and uh, Bogdan will, um, I'm sure, will answer some of them. And if you have any questions, do not uh, 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 just do not hesitate to post them in the chat or we may just uh, discuss it uh, in round table discussion after Bogdan's presentation. So Bogdan, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks Olya, so much. It's uh, it's real great pleasure, uh, pleasure for me to be invited uh, here to speak upon uh, the topics about sanctions and whether sanctions could be imposed against its own citizens, uh, the topics which are now heated, uh, are in heated debates. Uh, we all discussed this recent events uh, and recent decisions of the National Security Council, uh, Security and Defense Council, and uh, this decrease signed by the President regarding sanctions uh, against those who violated uh, like uh, certain law provisions, etc. So first of all, I would like to uh, share and uh, like provide few remarks uh, about Mr. Jake presentation. And I found extremely uh, notable that, uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Jake uh, said about that uh, wording used uh, by foreign agencies uh, which is working which are working on sanctions they are saying that sanctions is imposed uh, against uh, sometimes it is said that sanctions is imposed against ukraine and russia federation and the russian federation though it's really interesting even even i found like on the website of the european union it said that like sanctions is imposed uh, like it's about destabilization situation in Ukraine against Russian Federation. Again, it's it's a blurring, it's a vague determination of um, of this uh, legal position. Is it is that it is that uh, type of thing which we should avoid in future to be clear on what we're speaking about. Like, and it would be possibly like a task for our foreign ministry uh, to provide some, let's say, advice to its colleagues abroad that we should determine that sanctions is imposed against Russian Federation. And then is like explanation to that is, is that about like, yes, they imposed because Russian Federation destabilizing situation in Ukraine, but like this first title should be clear. And uh, it's excellent remark by Mr. Jake. I would say it's like should be put out as one of uh, like our today's conclusion and to put uh, before our foreign ministry for sure. But uh, let's return to the topic uh, to which I was invited uh, and present. And first of all, it's like a great pleasure to, uh, to see here my former professor and uh, my other colleagues I know, whom I know. Um, and the topic is about international court experience, experience of the European Court on Human Rights, experience of the European Court of Justice and other national courts uh, on questions and matters of sanctions. Let's uh, uh, let's like point point out uh, like some certain uh, in, important pitfalls we have uh, on the beginning, and the first is one that uh, we do not have. Let's say. Uh, a lot of cases in this type, uh, in this category of cases, uh, there is not uh, like numerous volume of cases we can uh, reflect, we can search out and uh, 
classify, let's say, and make some conclusions, uh, uh, like deliberate on some topics of legal uh, of legal matter, because like these cases are um, uh, like just there the, 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 the are only a few cases in in this category on challenging sanctions and the first one is a, one of the most important and well known is uh, is a case uh, which was considered by the european court of human rights it's uh, nada against switzerland uh, and this case is about um, italian citizen uh, who who is who was living in italia and uh, who moved at certain period of time uh, to uh, Campione d'Italia. It's, uh, I would probably may uh, misspell in here. I'm sorry for those who understand Italian better than me, uh, but like uh, this uh, man uh, was living in, in this, in that enclave on the territory of Switzerland. And uh, so it was around uh, like uh, one, two kilometers uh, to, uh, to Italian territory. To, to Italian main part territory from this enclave, which is like crossed uh, through Swiss territory. And uh, like um, th this person was uh, put on a list uh, on the UN sanctions list, uh, uh, according to UN resolution, I would not say number because it will not anyway uh, be remembered, but it was a Security Council resolution against uh, those who involved in terroristic attacks, in terrorist activities, in financing terrorism, and so on, and etc. And uh, following that, that person um, asked to pass uh, Swiss territory from the territory of Enclave to like uh, main part of Italy. And Swiss authority denied his access, saying that uh, such person was uh, on the list of security council of those person who are under sanctions. And one type of sanctions was that uh, um, security council imposed travel ban. So Swiss uh, authorities denied his access because it was security council resolution and uh, he couldn't uh, pass uh, through territory of Switzerland. It was clear and uh, such person like addressed uh, his uh, lodged his his petition to courts in Switzerland asking him to uh, asking uh, to put him away from this sanctions list arguing that he is not uh, engaging he was not engaging in touristic attacks in touristic activities uh, moreover he like is against he was against uh, touristic activities and so, so on etc uh, but uh, Swiss courts uh, denied uh, all his claims, denied all his petitions, uh, and um, the decision uh, rendered by Swiss court authorities was uh, the following: that uh, they like un understood the situation in which the person is appeared to be, but uh, uh, it is binding uh, obligations put on uh, Swiss. So. Uh, they couldn't move them, and uh, only the Security Council could uh, uh, could did that uh, in in the way which will be appropriate and uh, will be according to the UN, UN Charter. So um, uh, that person Nada uh, appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, and European Co Court of Human Rights rendered uh, the decision in which it found that a Swiss authority violated, uh, uh, violated the European Convention. Um, what to say is that the decision in another case was a prominent one, a notable one, and appeared to be a, a, one of the most striking decisions uh, uh, which was rendered by the European Court in, in, in recent years. And it is for sure because a lot of practitioners, a lot of uh, those who involved in, uh, uh, who actively involved in practice of the European Court of Hum Human Rights uh, said that um, European Court of Human Rights in, in, in some or other way, um, let's say, 
um, questioned uh, the supremacy of the UN Charter obligations imposed uh, through UN Charter obligations. Uh, probably I did not mention that like that decision was rendered uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, so uh, what what European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, said there? Uh, it, it said that uh, Swiss authorities should provide at least some guarantees, uh, procedural guarantees uh, to NADA and uh, like, uh, like avoiding and ignoring his demands of NADA. They violated Article 8 of the Convention and Article 13 of the Convention. Uh, they said that even if the person is on uh, UN Security, Sanction, Security Council sanctions list, such person is not uh, and cannot, couldn't be denied from all judicial guarantees provided by the convention. And uh, like that position was, uh, was uh, criticized, not criticized, but was commented and observed and uh, uh, put as a question before many, many lawyers, practitioners, and so on. Because uh, what court said here is not so clear for everyone and uh, even for me, because uh, doing so, the European Court of Human Rights um, said that uh, in certain instances, like uh, this uh, Security Council, or, or like uh, mandatory Security Council resolutions, which impose sanctions, might be uh, avoided from their implementation if, like, uh, if uh, these uh, guarantees provided by the European Convention are not followed by by authorities or like governmental bodies. Though, like, person who is on list uh, of the Security Council according to the European Court of Human Rights, should have, uh, should have the right to appeal uh, to court, uh, to be here before the court, to have minimal procedural guarantees. And um, that, that uh, point, which was made by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, made, like, let's say, a new step, a new, uh, a new page in this, uh, in this concepts of monism and dualism in international law, uh, putting that uh, uh, even decisions uh, rendered by Security Council uh, under Chapter Seven, uh, which is mandatory for every state uh, due uh, to the UN Charter and due to the, their binding nature, could be in certain cases when, like, some procedural guarantees are not provided could be ignored, which is not like clear from UN Charter uh, itself. So we now have a conflict between human rights guarantees and a conflict between UN Charter, which, uh, with which we should deal. Uh, again, that case uh, concerned only this person, uh, that person which was put on the list of UN. Uh, sanctions regime, not national sanctions regime. Um, I found at least one only case in which uh, uh, domestic courts uh, review uh, that uh, sanctions against its own citizens. And uh, I hope I will be correct in pronouncing uh, pronouncing this this case. It concerned it uh, concerned. Abdel Razik is a Sudan and Canadian citizen who uh, was born in Sudan and uh, moved uh, to Canada where he gained uh, Canadian citizenship. After that, he moved uh, back to Sudan uh, where, he, uh, where he was charged, uh, where he was uh, arrested and uh, he escaped to Canadian embassy, asking them uh, to uh, return him back to his, uh, to his country, to country of his, his citizen, citizenship, uh, Canada. Again, Canadian authorities was not uh, so in favor to do that. 
Uh, and uh, they said that uh, this Abdel Razik was on sanctions list uh, under UN Security Council resolution, uh, in which um, uh, this uh, man was under travel ban. So, like, uh, Canada could not ignore uh, this travel ban against the citizen, even uh, when, whenever this citizen even uh, has Canadian passports. So, Canadian authorities uh, ignored his demand and uh, do not uh, did not allow him to return back to Canada. Uh, after that, uh, this man appealed to Canadian uh, Supreme Court uh, or High Court of Canada. Probably I may misspell the correct uh, the correct name of that court, but uh, it's the highest judicial uh, institution in Canada, and uh, where where he won the case. And uh, the Canadian Supreme Court said that it was violation of his constitutional rights. And uh, though uh, Canadian authorities should allow him to return back to Canada, even despite uh, the UN Security Council resolution. Again, we, uh, we see here clear conflict of norms between UN Charter binding obligations and uh, between uh, human rights guarantees provided uh, or enshrined uh, in constitutional uh, documents. So we have like a lot of uh, legal work to do here and uh, a lot of views and points, point of views to, to reflect on what is evident. Uh, so it's, it's where I'm stopped because there are a few cases where we could like explore more about how international courts uh, like U European Court of Human Rights deal with, with such category of cases. But again, uh, it is not a widespread practice in the first place. And uh, in the second place, we couldn't say about like uh, that practice, uh, which, which is uh, like settled down now, because it's only one, two cases which does not reflect now uh, a certain type of uh, legal position of the European Court. So yes, it was a case where European Court found violation and uh, it tried to harmonize UN, UN obligations and European Convention obligations. Again, it, it is not so because uh, e even like uh, our judge from Ukraine, Yudkivska pointed out that uh, she disagree with uh, this point um, of the majority of the court and I agree with her. And again, that that is not a practice now. It only one, two cases which demonstrate some flaws, some like uh, uh, ways of thinking, but again, it's not a settled down practice which, which we can use everywhere and as a, like last, last in, instance uh, court practice of the European Court of Human Rights. So, uh, Olga, I will finish here. Probably I spent more time than, than, uh, than I need to, but again, if we want to explore more on legal initiatives we have in Ukrainian parliament, please say me that I have a few more minutes. If not, we can move to questions. Uh, thank you, Bogdan. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your presentation. And I think that uh, we will ask you to post the uh, names of the case um, of the cases in the chat later on. And I think that uh, we still have time. We have planned two hours for our today event. So um, please uh, post your questions in the chat so we can see how many questions we have. And in the meantime, Bogdan can proceed with legal initiatives, I think. And uh, then let's uh, move on to questions, if that works. If uh, anyone from participants have a um, question now and needs to go, just let us know and um, we are flexible. So no stress. Uh, while people are posting or thinking about their questions, let's proceed with um, legislative initiatives. Yeah. Uh, as you know, as everyone knows, I guess, uh, who follow like our sanctions legislation, uh, we have uh, severe shortcomings in our legal regulation. 
though uh, as practitioners uh, we joined together in team and uh, drafted uh, uh, draft law submitted by uh, numbers of MPs draft law on the principles of sanctions policy uh, like uh, among uh, Authors from Parliament is Elizaveta Yesko, uh, Podurayev, Tretyakova, and other members of uh, parliamentarian majority. So, uh, to start from from the beginning, what this initiative is about is about uh, complex change and systematic change to our sanctions regulation, because uh, the law which is in force now cannot be. Uh, applicable to all cases and cannot uh, and and, sh and showed like uh, a lot of negative sides which which it has and uh, it is a result what we have now uh, the application of that law so we need to change it uh, like complex in, in complex uh, and uh, we against uh, the position which is now uh, which is now popular among many stakeholders that we need some minor changes to the current law because minor change to the current law will not help in any way so just main principles and uh, main pitfalls we have in in our draft law is that we first of all we uh, move uh, to uh, to divide sanctions regime we need to divide uh, national and international sanctions regime and uh, they're absolutely different Ukraine should has clear national sanctions regime, which will be based uh, according to its uh, according to our national interest, according to our defense interest, according to our uh, foreign policy interest, like based on MV, uh, like our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it's our national sanctions regime. International sanctions regime is about how we join and how we uh, like uh, join to international sanctions which are imposed by the european union by the united states by canada australia and our strategic partners so it should be clear that these two types of regime are absolutely different and should be divided and not to be confused anymore uh, because now you know that Ukraine joined to the European Union sanctions only on political level. And it's a very fragile question because, you know, European Union uh, put real judicial mechanism to introduce sanctions. However, still we join European Union sanctions only on the level of political statements. Uh, the other topic is that we introduce liability for violation of sanctions. We proposed few draft laws to criminal court uh, and uh, effective instruments to have like that uh, types of criminal responsibility for those who violate sanctions to date there are no persons and no company uh, which was uh, which were charged uh, under well under the criminal court uh, to uh, for violation of sanctions so like we have zero responsibility for sanctions violation the third important step is that we propose the creation of the Office for Sanctions Policy, which to be uh, set under National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, and which will be which will serve as a principal body inside this National Security Council uh, to manage all matters related to sanctions policy. Because now we have so many actors in sanctions regime and we do not know who is responsible for such many uh, sanctions, who could clarify on them, who could provide recommendations on how to deal with sanctions who could uh, set some criteria and explanations. The next slide is, is a roadmap how we see our sanctions policy should be uh, reformed, is that it should start from adoption a new law. Then we should set up this sanctions uh, office for sanctions policy on the National Security Council. The third step is to prepare uh, this normative legal acts on the level of the cabinet of ministers and the level of national security councils 
which will allow like these uh, tools, effective tools on the level of the governing bodies. And the last step is that we should analyze it again, like one year after it is going on and uh, provide like a uh, SWOT analysis on how it's working, where we have weak sides, where we have shortcomings, and then to reform that sh shortcomings with new sanctions architecture. Uh, and the most important one uh, we see is uh, one of the main and uh, probably the uh, shortcomings we have uh, is that we do not have this register of sanctions. It's like crazy thing that we have sanctions against uh, 3,000 uh, persons, uh, 1,000 companies, but you can find them only on the website of the president of Ukraine and some of sanctions list are not like text itself. It's only scanned copies of uh, images. So to find some company, a person which is under sanctions, you need uh, like literally uh, to look through all pages of the presidential website and uh, to see like who is on sanctions list. So it is, uh, important thing we we proposed uh, like to set this register for everyone and business law companies uh, it, it will be easier for everyone to find who is under sanctions now we have this last two slides which shows how procedure will be look like and it is very clear who proposed who prepare opinions who consider the implementation who take up decision who approves them and who will monitor for the implementation. It's for about national sanctions and I will know like going in deep here, but uh, uh, I will share the presentation and you can see easily how it should be like. Because even now, uh, look at step 1.1, we uh, spent our Ministry of Foreign Affairs spent around six months to join the UN Security Council sanctions. But sometimes these uh, sanctions imposed by a Security Council, uh, like uh, they ended uh, quickly than six months. So our, procedure, our procedures are too bureaucratic, uh, are too slowly uh, and uh, are not effective at all. So all that about is to make our sanctions policy more effective. Thank you again for, for watching and for listening. We'll be happy to, to provide questions, uh, to answer to, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. It was uh, really interesting and structured. I think that uh, everyone has uh, heard about uh, this um, initiative. And now we have a more structured um, uh, opinion and presentation about that. Uh, I think that uh, we uh, have uh, questions uh, here in the chat, so maybe let's uh, move to them. And uh, I also have questions, so maybe uh, if we have time, we may take it as well. So we have a question from uh, Vlad Bandrovsky. He asks whether uh, sanctions impose um, limitations on enforcement of foreign arbitration awards and uh, Jake just um, answered him in the chat but maybe Jake uh, do you want to take uh, this question and deliberate a bit more about it or just um, uh, read your <laughs> answer sure thank you Olga well yes I wasn't quite sure um in, in, just in case uh, uh Vlad needed to to leave I just wanted to uh, provide a quick answer. Um, I also want to say um, th thank you to both you and to Bodan for your very interesting presentations. Um, it was uh, particularly interesting and Bodan, I think, you know, I, I mentioned at the start and, and Olga touched on as well with sanctions. Well, it's designed to help avoid military conflicts, which tend to occur out of quick decisions where people are behaving perhaps uh, more aggressively and, and not taking the time to, to think slowly and, and, and really uh, develop a, a, a response that maybe is, is suitable or appropriate. And, and yet, you know, when we want to impose the regime designed to, to perhaps put the brakes on these kinds of, of actions, it's, 
it's a shame that that process has that bureaucracy and that slowness to it uh, when it's designed to try and, and uh, I suppose, avoid these, these quick reactions that can escalate, um, particularly if we look at some of the conflicts occurring today. Um, you know, it, it's, it's that uh, hot headedness, maybe you could call it, um, as opposed to, to that uh, slower uh, bureaucratic diplomatic approach which of course I'm sure frustrates many, many politicians and practitioners at times, um, but certainly should be uh, made more efficient, I think. Um, but in terms of the question and, and relating to arbitral uh, awards, um, it, it's a really, it's considered to be a really hot topic at the moment, international sanctions and uh, international arbitration. Um, it, it occurs uh, more often than people would imagine. Um, particularly where you're dealing with uh, certain um, uh, developing parts of the world or uh, companies with, with uh, assets in, in uh, regions or, or joint ventures with companies um, that uh, interestingly have a, a controlling or, or, or um, uh, principal company in, in uh, for example, certain Central Asian countries. Um, and uh, of course, there's, there's plenty of examples. Um, and where it's most uh, acute is where, uh, because the US, I mentioned the US sanctions regime being uh, so, uh, I suppose, um, so much greater in, in terms of the amount of sanctions and the economic heft and power of the US to, to alter the course of, of business uh, and international commerce. And of course, the role of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency, um, the issues crop up frequently when it relates to whether it's an individual sanction uh, or even a, a regional sanction against uh, a state. Um, and, and frequently it occurs when there is um, an imposition that a certain person cannot trade in US currency, for example, or, or an entity cannot, um, cannot use US dollars, uh, or a, a sanctioned person cannot receive a payment at all, um, according to particular sanctions regimes. And in the case of the US, uh, because of its uh, connection to banks and, and various other financing entities, uh, yes, um, uh, th there's, there's a lot of case law um, as well uh, about that. I've just seen some things in the chat. But um, yes, when it comes to uh, such situations, um, it, it won't always affect the enforcement and subsequent execution of an award. Um, it, it the lawyer's answer, it depends. Of course, if you are trying to enforce your award in the US, for example, or in a, a country where they very closely follow the regimes of uh, the, the, the US, uh, you, you may well encounter some issues. But if, for example, if you're trying to uh, enforce an award in another jurisdiction, uh, but there is an issue raised based on a US uh, sanctions regime, this may not be sufficient grounds to uh, to uh, prevent the enforcement of the award in uh, in a jurisdiction such as, for example, France, uh, where there was a recent case where uh, the, because that the U.S. sanctions regime uh, was not uh, part of the French sanctions regime, um, be it part of the UN or the EU. Um, it was not considered to therefore be a, a, um, a violation of French uh, public policy. So when it comes to enforcement and execution, it depends on where you are, it depends on what the currency is, um, but it can absolutely cause issues and, and give rise to, to challenges. Uh, and certainly it, it's a, a live issue at the moment in arbitration. So I hope that I hope that is is something of an answer. Thank you, Jake. Uh, 
we have uh, more comments in the chat and uh, uh, we have more cl um, clarifications from Sergei Grishko. Uh, he's a partner at Redcliffe Partners. Uh, and uh, Sergei, if you want uh, to speak or to join our discussion right now, just uh, and if it is comfortable to you to switch on microphone or video or whatever you want, just feel free to do that. We would be happy. Uh, if you may um, join our discussion, great. Thank you, Sergei. Yeah, uh, thank you, Olga. Uh, thank you, Jake. Thank you, um, Bogdan as well. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting speeches. Just very quick uh, intervention on this as I started this in the chat. So yes, uh, the the issue was very much a theoretical one a few years back. In Ukraine, uh, it is, is it is no more. Uh, this has been at least in Ukraine, it has been decided that um, sanctions imposed on um, award on persons which are uh, arbitral award creditors uh, may prevent enforcement on public policy grounds in Ukraine. Even though uh, there were there were four cases, four series, four cases uh, between the same parties, which was a Russian. Um, defense enterprise aviafed service and ukrainian defense enterprise atem uh, relating to contracts pre-war contracts extending back some pre-2014 era so um, uh, i understand that uh, the russian enterprise took uh, atem to arbitration in russia and obtained four arbitral awards against it and try to enforce these in Ukraine. So the, he, it was successful with the, with the first one, but then the Supreme Court changed its mind and held expressly that um, the, and, and in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, when those arbitral awards were being issued, uh, Fed service was uh, designated as a, as a um, sanctioned entity by the president. Of Ukraine. So um, the Supreme Service eventually held that the designation of uh, Aviafed service actually prevents the recognition and enforcement of the arbitral awards in its favor in Ukraine on the basis of public policy grounds. The question is whether uh, foreign sanctions for imposed by foreign countries may have the same effect in Ukraine. Uh, the answer most likely will depend on whether those sanctions, uh, whether Ukraine uh, also uh, is in line with those sanctions, whether the uh, similar sanctions are imposed uh, by the Ukrainian government. Otherwise, uh, of course, they would have no effect in Ukraine. And even, even more so, we can uh, end up uh, having to uh, give effect to Russian sanctions, for instance, which would would be completely nonsensical given the situation. Or North Korean sanctions, I'm sure the guys have a lot of sanctions against uh, various capitalist bastards. Or uh, other uh, beautiful country sanctions, such as from Venezuela to, to Iran, for instance. So I think the question would, would really depend whether those foreign countries' sanctions are uh, allied with the Ukrainian sanctions lists. And thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak here. Thank you very much, Sergei, uh, for joining us. And uh, we are um, more than happy if uh, anyone wants to join and speak. We are super flexible and we are here just to friendly discuss uh, the hot topic. And just for benefit of uh, our um, um, uh, listeners from Facebook, because some people could not join uh, us in Zoom, uh, but uh, they uh, um, see this uh, broadcasted on Facebook, uh, we were discussing the topic uh, on uh, do sanctions impose limitations on enforcement of uh, foreign arbitration awards. 
and uh, Jake uh, has provided uh, his um, answer in the chat that sanctions can pose various problems, particularly if the execution of an award would breach an international sanctions regime. It can also give rise to challenges to an award on public policy grounds, also generally this is limited to multilateral sanctions here in EU. And then uh, Sergei Grishko that just um, spoke uh, added uh, again in the chat that uh, the Ukrainian Supreme Court has recently held in a series of related cases that sanctions imposed on award creditors prevent the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards on public policy grounds. And um, he referred to a series of cases um, of Artom uh, versus other federal service series of cases uh, at the Ukrainian Supreme Court. Um, so um, there is actually more discussion in the chat, but next time people who are listening to us on Facebook will have more motivation to join Zoom. Uh, so I will not read all that comments. Uh, but um, if anyone else wants to speak or wants to uh, ask any questions, just feel free to do that. And uh, while you are thinking, about this, I would um, suggest uh, another um, comment, I would say, just for discussion, uh, that uh, for me, it is a thing from which uh, we have started our publications and uh, our event. For me, there is a difference um, when there is a national, for example, we are talking about national of Ukraine, Ukrainian citizen, and um, he is under sanctions of United Nations, uh, of or the US sanctions, EU sanctions. We know that, for example, in some cases, uh, there is uh, USA that is first imposing some sanctions on any individual or um, company, and then you and uh, UN might just uh, follow it. Sometimes it's just vice versa, UN, um, then US and EU follow, and other countries. And then uh, Ukraine. Um, implements uh, sanctions against uh, uh, that people as well as I told just to support um, other state in um, stopping of illegal actions. But there is another situation when um, Ukrainian citizen is not um, is not yet for example, um, a designated person according to US or international UN sanction regime, uh, but Ukraine has already used um, national sanction regime against um, this person. I'm talking about Ukrainian national. Uh, and in light of the Bohdan's um, presentation about European Court of Human Rights practice in that sense, and uh, conflict between sanction regimes and human rights. Do you think, uh, I think that this question is to both Bogdan and Jake, uh, that uh, there is a difference in the evaluation of um, uh, actions of such state, um, if it just follows international uh, sanction regimes and, and impose sanctions against a designated person regardless its citizenship, or if uh, it just from the very first uh, um, point starts to introduce sanctions against um, the person. So, Bogdan, do you have any view on this? I just uh, mi missed uh, like a few, few last words, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, so I am saying that uh, do you have um, any view and do you think that there might be a difference to different approaches to assessing the action of the state on imposing sanction, sanctions against its own individual? In first case, we are talking about if this individual, regardless being Ukrainian citizen, for example, is already under UN, US, EU sanctions, and other case, uh, other option, if it has not been yet designated as um, person under US, EU, UN sanctions, but Ukraine was first to introduce sanctions against this person. Yeah, it's uh, just the story should be like divided whether the person has Ukrainian citizenship or, or not, like it's two separate stories. Uh, um, 
like we know that we have a lot of sanctions, personal sanctions against Ukrainian citizens who, let's say, live in Crimea and who was put under Ukrainian sanctions. Um, what I think here is probably maybe useful is to say that they, to certain regard, maybe lose this effective, effective uh, tie, effective connection with Ukraine, probably. However, they remain the citizenship of Ukrainian Ukraine. And again, it's 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 a very complicated question because I see how Office of President ex explained uh, this uh, sanctions rationale as they said that is all about terroristic activities. They called uh, that those who are under who, who, let's say, uh, who, uh, like economic terrorists, they call them economic, uh, those who making economic touristic attacks, let's say. I don't know how, how to depict it more. Again, I don't feel uh, my personal view is, is not support the, that position of the president. Again, it's, it's, it is under review of Supreme Court of Ukraine uh, in, in certain cases now. Uh, I, I really don't know the core and the right answer and just only my feelings say that is not the way to to put things because uh, I guess Ukraine is the first country in the world which uh, make so large sanctions regime against its own citizens and honestly to be among among this judicial, uh, let's say, novatory, I don't know English, like those who experiment with some judicial instruments is not to be a good idea because it's very vague thing uh, at the end. So just, uh, I feel that probably other ways should be should be fine. Thank you, Bogdan. I think that uh, um, I think that question is it possible and uh, is it needed? Your answer is it may be possible, but maybe it is not needed. <laughs> we have question from uh, Dmitro or comment. Uh, so maybe let's um, uh, take it and then Jake might comment both uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Olga. It's actually both. Uh, first, uh, it will be comment and then a question. So, um, speaking about the comment, um, I just want to uh, add a few points to the discussion we had uh, earlier about the uh, arbitral award and uh, how sanctions regimes uh, may in, uh, may interact with those awards. I do not recall any particular case in the case law of, uh, for instance, uh, of the UK's courts. But um, there is one that is quite similar in its logic. It was the case of Maud versus Lee, which is an abbreviation. I unfortunately don't remember what it stands for. Uh, but still, uh, that case was about the repayment um, uh, repayment of some sum of money to the uh, a person who uh, was sanctioned by the UK. And um, the court in that case distinguished two types of sanctions. It's actually the asset freeze and the uh, prohibition to make funds available. And according to the court, uh, when it sanctions, when uh, the person is in the sanction list uh, and it's, uh, the, the, that person is sanctions uh, um, uh, using the, the formula asset freeze, then the repayment may be done without the violation of sanctions regime. And when uh, the sanction that is uh, applied, the uh, particular sanction measure that is applied against the person is the uh, prohibition on making funds available, then the repayment would would intervene, would violate the sanction regime. Uh, so um, again, according to uh, the UK's practice, uh, probably um, uh, the, um, uh, the um, implementation of the arbitral award uh, or legality of the uh, implementation of the arbitral award would, um, uh, would uh, actually depend on the type of sanction that is applied against the person. 
uh, that would be my my comment and also i have a question to jake uh, jake if i um, understood you correctly you mentioned that in sweden it's prohibited to apply sanctions against own citizens if the sanctions intervene their economic and social rights is it correct and what do you mean by uh, how should we understand that economic and social rights of citizens of swedish citizens are um, uh, violated by uh, sanctions or sanctions intervene their their rights thank you uh, thank you dimitra uh, really uh, interesting point thank you uh, and and as to your question yes so it was a case that that did go to the european court of of human rights and it was a, a question of can the state implement uh, sanctions against certain individuals to the extent that uh, such sanctions would prevent those individuals from being able to uh, use their bank and uh, account and, and uh, you know, buy food and, and pay rent and, and all of the essentials um, that are that are to 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 live, uh, you know, your your life in in Sweden. Um, the the Swedish government in that case actually, or, or the state, uh, hadn't uh, implemented them uh, on the basis that well, if we do so, then these people won't have access to any state support payments, for example, or have access to uh, uh, I think it was um, the state insurance um, agency. So yes, there were. Um, it, it was a decision taken that was then uh, moved forward to. Um, uh, after all uh, other avenues were exhausted to uh, the European Court of Human Rights, of course. So, um, and it was that court decision that, uh, yes, to live a Largon life, um, Largon being, uh, the, the, as, as Olga has commented, Largon being a, a very Swedish term um, that's not easily translated to English, but refers to just enough, uh, not too much, um, the right amount in both a good and bad way, um, just right, essentially. Um, and, and, and that, that is something that, um, is the, the Swedish government was, uh, um, essentially required to, um, ensure for its citizens, despite the fact that they were subject to sanctions, um, which I think, uh, it also adds um, to um, Bordan's um, point uh, as well. And I think, you know, when, when looking at, um, you know, the, the, the example of, of uh, Ukraine and, and the fact that you have citizens of de facto citizens or de jure citizens and, and what does this actually imply? And, and, you know, what does citizenship itself mean what is uh, nationality? I mean, these are really fundamental questions that can only be determined uh, by the sovereign state itself in respect to its own territory and the people that reside there um, with due regard to their own, um, to, to such persons' um, universal human rights, uh, which of course are protected by international law. Um, and for example, it, it's, it's a common discussion um, or, or certainly amongst lay people, you know, shouldn't we just strip the citizenship of, of these people and, and throw them out and, and send them away and so on. And, um, you know, when, when we get to the point that people have perhaps dual citizenships or, uh, you know, they live and reside in another part of the world and, and um, are exercising their rights there, um, it, 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 it's, it's a very challenging area. And I think um, the Ukraine case, um, well, the, what is the alternative in many ways? And perhaps it's also um, a question of, well, if you have, um, it, in my case, I, I, I am a, a common law lawyer. And of course that involves a lot of judge made law. Um, so, you know, in, in our case, the courts, have a particular role to play in the development of the law and and if the legislation hasn't been able to respond uh, swiftly enough to to the, the requirements of society and a judge can uh, find sufficient legal basis for a particular decision um, you know that that is that is part of our system but as you say you know that doesn't mean to say that the judge can simply do what he or she likes but rather um, the rule of law has to be respected. 
Um, but in this case, uh, you know, well, whose rule of law, you know, wouldn't the rule of law not uh, have led to an annexation, for example, you know, so we're in, we're in a, a really um, unusual territory, if you excuse my pun. Um, but so I, I um, my personal view is, you know, well, if, if, uh, you know, I, I were a politician, and I saw, uh, you know, fellow citizens, but in a, in a part of the territory that was under the control of a of a, um, a foreign power, I, I probably would be agitating for some kind of sanctions as well, um, regardless of, of how, how much effect they ultimately have. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question and I'm, and I'm so pleased that it was um, discussed so eloquently and debated this evening. Thank you, Jake. Uh, thank you, Dmitro. Um, I think that we may start finishing our events. Our event. If anyone have any questions, uh, it's last chance to raise it. But otherwise, uh, we may come to the conclusions. Uh, today we were speaking about sanctions. What's new for Ukraine? Uh, the um, event uh, was conducted under the umbrella of Ukrainian uh, Bar Association, International Law Committee of Ukrainian Bar Association. And uh, I think that uh, we are aligned on uh, the fact that sanctions um, nowadays, it is not some something, some topic where you can draw any black or white A or B conclusion. Uh, it is a very unilateral to to topic, I would say, and uh, it conflicts a lot with human rights topic. It um, may conflict with um, uh, other um, areas of practice, for example, enforcement of perpetual awards. And um, nowadays, Ukraine, um, I think, has all uh, <laughs> cases to develop this topic in legal doctrine. I would say that Ukraine uh, have has the chance to uh, to be an example in different uh, law um, lectures and uh, books for students all over the world for the next 100 years. As an example, uh, how the topic of, uh, topic of international sanctions developed. As um, I would uh, agree with uh, Bogdan that um, just not said that sanctions, it is not the topic where you can experiment a lot and uh, be a first uh, in practice country that uh, decided to implement a new tradition on implemented, for example, uh, um, sanctions against its own citizens. And uh, even though it is quite hard to find any answer here, is it good or is it bad? Is it possible or not? Is it needed or not? Mm, we um, have been aligned that um, it is good when countries, when states are aligned on sanctions, when any national sanction regime is based on international sanction regime. And uh, if we impose uh, sanctions against its own citizens, even if it is not absolutely not situation, there might be situation in life when it might be necessary, but it is absolutely not the situation where you can just uh, think, okay, let's try to do it because we are thinking that uh, it might be a good idea without, impo without referring to any other types of responsibilities. So sanctions, it is a um, really good instrument, but if you overuse it and misuse and maybe abuse it, it uh, we might end up in not very good situation, but as lawyers, we might get uh, more clients. So uh, thank you everyone uh, for, um, Jake just posted uh, in the chat and again for our Facebook listeners I will read uh, he referred to Swedish case and it is a case Aden et al versus council and um, commission and case number it is T um, 306 slash 
the zero one just in case someone would uh, want to um, refer to these cases. Otherwise, uh, I think that uh, we might uh, start, uh, we might uh, finish our event. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. It was super interesting. Thank you, Bohdan. Thank you, Jake, for sharing your presentations. Uh, thank you, Sergei and Dmitro for comments. Thank you everyone um, for listening to us and stay tuned with our next events. Bye-bye.